Hey, hi, hello. I don't need to tell you that electric bikes are taking over the world. And that probably slash maybe makes some trail users a little grumpy. But from a climate perspective, it's absolutely a good thing. Electric motorcycles, maybe not quite so much. It's not exactly a revolution, but filling the gap is a new bike from UBCO, relatively new bike from UBCO that fills that gap between bikes and motorcycles. It has a two wheel drive that combines the best of both. And today we're gonna to talk about how this is just about the most fun you can have in a saddle and why bikes like this may very well be the future of backcountry mobility. I'm Stephen Casimiro. I'm your host here at the Adventure Journal Podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Also with me is Justin Houseman. Hey, Justin. Hello, hello. How are you? I'm good. I don't have a fancy, cool uh, e-motorcycle, though. It'd be a lot huh. better if I had one of those. You, your life would be so much better. I, I suspect it might be orders of magnitude better. This is the one you're... thing that would finally make me complete. You know, it's the same for me. I don't have one, actually, and it is, it's the one material thing that would finally, <laughs> after all these years... <laughs> there it is. <laughs> That's there a... it is. I would never, ever want for another thing. If I Perfect. had an electric 2 by 2 motorcycle from UBCO, I'm well, just saying. I, do, I mean, Santa, if you're listening... <laughs> Santa's always listening. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't have to have to visit the Casimiro household ever again. Just this, this would be the last time. Well, Joni might have to take issue with that. But yeah, yeah. For, as far as I'm concerned, you know, this would be the last thing I will ever ask for. I promise. So uh, yeah, Justin heard me uh, rave about the UBCO. So I had, um, I borrowed an UBCO 2 by 2 special edition from the company and I had it for, I, I don't know, probably longer than they wanted me to have it, but three or four months. And then I finally dragged my feet and they, they came in, they, they took it back from me. And Justin, you, do you remember those days? Was there, was there ever a day that I did not rave about that bike? No, I bet you're, there's probably claw marks on it from when they, when you had to give it back. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah there's no, no you did. You never. You, you did not stop talking about it. That's true. <laughs> no, I didn't. You know, I'm not exaggerating when I say it's just about the most fun you can have. It. I mean, I was thinking about this. So I was thinking about the bikes in my life or my bike career that made a different. Like they so changed how I felt about riding. And there was my very first bike. And then um, there was my first uh, dirt bike that I got on with a motor, a little Honda 70, I think it was. And then there was my first mountain bike, which was a Ross Mount St. Helens in like 1982 or 83 wow. when mountain bikes were just coming on the scene. And I was like, oh, I can ride on anything, anywhere with this bike. I remember riding through fields of grass, which is the dumbest thing ever, but I could ride my bike across it. <laughs> um, and then uh, I, I don't know if there was another bike until the UBCO, maybe my first real full suspension, like the VPP design, which Santa Cruz has really popularized. But the first time I threw a leg over the UBCO, so, so let me tell you a little bit about the bike. So it's um, unique in that it has two wheel drive. It has motors at both the front and the back hubs, which with electric vehicles is not uncommon, but electric motorcycles or a bike, that's that's pretty unusual. And so, and it's electric, so as with most electric vehicles, when you twist the throttle, man, you just jump off the line and uh, instantly. And with that power going to both wheels, there's, you know, you don't like, I was lucky enough to test a zero motorcycle over a decade ago when they first came out and they put it on like Bambi mode and the torque was still in, insane. I like, I popped a wheelie, I almost fell off the back. So with a two wheel drive, that's not gonna happen. It's just boom, you, you're you off and running. Um, so it's it's just a hoot. It's just, it's it's so much fun. Um, the, the backstory in the company, so UBCO, I should have asked these guys what UBCO stands for. I, <laughs> that's I, my I, first. That's my first <laughs> note. Like, what? Is, what is that? Sorry, newbie mistake. <laughs> uh, they're going to take away my journalism degree. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what that. I don't know what it. But they they were a couple of dudes. They were a couple of inventors 
down on the North Island of New Zealand who wanted to create the, the perfect utility farm bike. So something that was sturdy, stout, that could go over all terrain. They do get a little rain from time to time in New Zealand, so could handle mud or muck. Um, and that's why they focused on the, the two-wheel drive nature of it. They started in uh, 2014, and they first came to the U.S. with a production bike in 2017. And now they have offices in Bend in Oregon and Mount Monganui, which is on the North Island. It's on the East Coast of the North Island. And a few years ago, I actually got to, uh, took a vacation in, in New Zealand and was maybe 30 or 40 kilometers north of um, Mount Monganui. And man, that is just spectacular beach country, mountains, beach. It's just, it's, boy, if you're going to be based anywhere in New Zealand, it looks like a pretty, um, a pretty special place to be. So at this point, the bike is in its fifth iteration and they have a bunch of different configurations to the platform. The one that I tested is called the special edition. It's kind of a, a khaki green um, with uh, a neat bag in the center and a neat bag that goes on the back and then kind of orange touch, touch points. Yeah, before I dive into the specs on it and, and start telling you, we're, we're going to talk about what it rides, but how it rides, but I wanted to sort of give you the lay land. Justin, do you have anything you want to ask before I dive into some of the the key facts? Not really. I mean, you're going to, well, I mean, the first thought that's going to jump out to me or anyone probably is how much it costs, but I'm assuming you'll get, you'll work that in. Well, I'll tell you that now. So the one I tested is seven grand. The bottom end, um, I, I'm pretty sure it's the exact, it's the same frame and everything. Mm -hmm. It's just not quite as well specced and it has a smaller battery. So it doesn't have as much range. It's, it's 4,000. So, so the range is, you know, the, the price range is from 4,000 to 7,000. And then you can, there's a, there's a hunting model, which we'll address, which is 6,500. And then there's a special edition. And the main thing about the special edition that separates it from some of the others is that it's, it's street legal. So for anybody that doesn't already uh, have a foot in the world of electric mountain bikes, for example, or even like cargo bikes, something that you're, you know, that you, that, that would be sort of similarly uh, spec, you would think that's right about the range of like a mid, a mid range electric mountain bike price for the most part, like four to seven, you'll, you'll be able to get like a decently spec uh, electric mountain bike. Most of the higher end ones are going to be around at least seven. I've read some that are 12, you know, grand. So yeah. And then like my, my electric cargo bike, I think was six grand brand new. So, you know, seems to be right about there. I would think that, I would think that the, I don't know if the tech is more advanced or something like that in, in something that's purely throttle based. I don't know why it would be more expensive or less expensive, but I mean, it's right about the same as you'd expect to pay for any other, like reasonably specced electric bike type thing. Right. And when we start talking about applications and how a bike like this might be used, we'll talk about some of the competitors and some of the other price ranges. We'll also discuss how discuss how this is um, similar or different from a pedal bike, um, a pedal e-mountain e bike. Um, and we can talk about those prices as we get on. So, okay, so just sort of the tail of the tape really quickly here. Um, as I mentioned, it's two wheel drive. It weighs about 155 pounds with the battery. The top speed is 30 miles per hour. One of the things that I love about the hunting edition is that it it has a like a boost mode that will go to forty. Um, <laughs> so, so if you have to flee like an angry moose or something, <laughs> something. So I'm wondering if it's possible to, to chip the special edition and get uh that's funny. get forty out of it. The range is about seventy five miles. I probably wouldn't trust seventy five miles because um, I wouldn't want to be pushing one hundred and fifty pounds. But uh, we'll talk more about that as we get on. Um, it does have active and passive re brake regeneration to the battery. The front suspension is 130 millimeters of travel, hmm. and the rear is about 120 millimeters of rear travel. Can you um, shut off the the? Um, is it selective in terms of two wheel drive, or is it full? Is it full time? Uh, it is full time, and that is one of my complaints about it. So, so let's talk a little bit about the handling. Um, the first thing that you notice is that it's it's just so quick off the line. Um, you. There are adjustments within the app, and um, so you can get uh, you can put a governor on your I think on your speed mode. You, there are ways to stretch your performance with this, um, and I th I think that there's uh, 
I think the standard is like rabbit mode for twerk. Um, and I should have pulled out my app. Well, I don't actually have it cause I sent the bike back way. Out. Um, but there are definitely adjustments that you can do in terms of like how fast and how, and how to maximize your range on it. I just wrote everything stock cause mm -hmm. it, it just felt, it felt perfect. You get up to speed really quickly. You're not throwing off the back. Um, and you're, uh, it just feels ideal. Um, one of the things that struck me was that the, the center of weight is quite low on it. So it feels very stable, but it never feels really sluggish. I wrote it on dirt roads. I wrote it on, um, on the street. I can't remember what the mileage I probably put between 150 and 200 miles on it. And, um, you know, maybe 20% of that was in the dirt I would have liked, or was on fire roads or, um, single track. It's not going to be a bike that you throw around like, say, a specialized Turbo Levo. You know, it's it's a utility bike. It's designed for utility, um, but it's it's a gas, and um, it feels like because it's street legal. So, well, to me, it sort of fell into this kind of gray area where it's a it's a bike that is unique to itself. So, I didn't buy the bike, so I didn't I didn't get a uh, a plate for it. Um, I rode it on the road for, on lower speed limit streets. I just rode it in the middle of the road, kind of more for safety for higher speed limits. I rode it in the bike lane, um, never rode it on the sidewalk, but I felt comfortable like going to my grocery store and parking it on the sidewalk. I felt comfortable in some areas where people were doing throttle e-bikes on bike trails, taking it there. Mm -hmm. it, it felt like it was sort of this kind of limbo spot where you could kind of do anything you wanted with it. And now a cop might argue with that, yeah. but I, I never rode where there were pedestrians or I was going to be obnoxious about it. Um, it felt like this amazing kind of do everything, go as fast as you would want, go anywhere you would want. Motorcycle maybe sort of looks like any motorcycle. Did people ask, do you get a lot of feedback or a lot of people asking what, what you were on? Oh my God. Everywhere I went, people stopped yeah. me. People, I've never been on in a vehicle that people asked me so much about since I, I had my um, VW van again, the totally. Pro, which was mm -hmm. fully decked for off road. Yeah, people stopped me constantly to ask me about it. Anybody mad about it? Around here, people would be really mad for just because they hate anything with two wheels. But um, yeah, but that's Marin, California, right? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> no, do people like here, get that out of the bike lane or anything like that. Anybody have any issues? No, lots of thumbs up, actually. That's cool. um, down here, so I'm in South Orange County, California. It, I'm guessing this is ground zero for e-bike use nationally, or one of the ground zeros. Um, there's a lot of people with a lot of money, so they get their yeah. kids. Um, you see Super 73s a lot. You see Rad Runners. You see a lot of throttle bikes. The kids here go nuts on them. You see these big mobs of... <laughs> five, eight, nine young boys, you know, doing wheelies silent. And, you know, I'm sure there are people that think that, that they're menaces, but I'm like, I look at those kids and I think, ah, oh, man, if I had one of those when I was oh, that yeah. age, like, it's, are you kidding me? They're just. We, we'd all have been doing the same thing. All of us would have had, the, would have jumped at the chance to have something like that. Yeah. I hear that up here too. Cause we get, we'll get that. We'll get the kids with their, I don't even know what they are. They're like super light. Uh, they look like dirt bikes, um, but they have pedals often, but not super 73, but even smaller and lighter. And kids love doing weird, like wheelie tricks all over the place. But I would have been doing that. I love seeing it. I mean, the only thing I worry about is, is them getting hurt. And I know that yeah. there has been an uptick, but they're not doing anything wrong. You know, there's some, I'll call them sacrificial lands. There's, there's places where they're building jumps and other thing like that and things like that. And they probably shouldn't. And I'm just trying not to get my boxers in a bunch over stuff like that because, you know, there's places adjacent, there's like tons of stuff that is just sort of thrash lands, you know, and. So I, you don't need a motorcycle license for this? You do not. No. Huh. Because one of the reasons I never got like a Vespa or anything was I never really wanted to go through with the, the uh, I just didn't want to have to deal with like, well, I've actually never ridden a motorcycle in my entire life of any kind. So I didn't want to have to deal with kind of learning how and then going to the DMV. And then dealing with whatever the like one day class is. Uh, plus, also my wife would have killed me <laughs> the second I tried to buy any kind of motorcycle. But uh, yeah, so I, I I sort of assume that you would need a uh, motorcycle license for something like this, but I guess not. You don't. And for me, that was a big part of the appeal because I'm in I'm in the same boat. I 
rode a motorcycle in college for a while, and I just don't really feel like going through the whole yeah. process. <laughs> um, it's not a big deal, and it's probably good to go through all the safety reminders, but it's a pain. Did you, you just know? wear? Did you wear a regular bike helmet, or did you get like a motorcycle helmet? I wore my regular bike helmet. So if I had bought it, I would have bought a regular motorcycle helmet um, for sure. But I wasn't going to buy a helmet for something I knew I was only going to have for a short period of time. Yeah. And I, I have to say that <laughs> doing this episode and revisiting my experience on it is killing me because <laughs> I, you know, like the first time I wrote it and the second time I wrote it and the 20th time I wrote it, I was like, this bike is, this loaner bike is not going back. Like, yeah, I'm, you said I'm, that a lot. You told me that you weren't going to send it back a lot. <laughs> I know. And then, and then when it came down to it, I I just didn't have the budget. And now I'm I'm just going, you know, I I just I might have to bite the bullet and and buy one. And uh, you you you, how did you get it around? Did you have a special rack or something? I did. I got a a, a roll up rack, um, and uh, that was fine with the tongue weight on my truck. Interesting. Okay. Um, but I, most everything I did, I just rode from the house. Oh, uh, yeah. And, yeah. And I did, man, I did so many errands on this thing mm -hmm. going out. To, I mean, I just, I, what do we need? You know, oat milk? I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd be back, you know, and I would park it. I, I felt completely fine parking on the sidewalk in front of Trader Joe's, you know, where you would like where the bike rack was, where you, where you would put your bike, you know, not being a jerk about it. And I, you know, I would just throw the lock or I'd, I'd lock it or I'd turn it off and lock the, um, the handlebars and I'd run in there and I'd leave my helmet on and look like a dork and I'd grab my oat milk and I'd, I'd be home in less than 10 minutes. And I mean, you I just like, just... <laughs> you, you just like nailed the like Southern California bingo card right there. I mean, you, your e-bike to get oat milk at Trader Joe's. <laughs> I mean, what else? What else? What can, like... I add? what can I add to that? <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> what else is on the bingo card? I know. Um, I mean, here, yeah, they hear the, the weather's spectacular so much of the time. And, uh, man, if, if you ever want to, like, if there's any academics out there that want to do a sociological mm -hmm. cultural case study on the adoption of electric utility bikes and motorcycles come here because people are hauling their surfboards around, they're doing their groceries. There's at our, our really, there's a very fun little um coffee beer place uh next to me or near me down the block uh called project social and on weekends there's there's as many e-bikes there probably as there are cars i mean just everybody has them around here and and this is a perfect place to use them because it's very hilly um the weather's great the streets are wide um there's wide bike lanes and um you know, getting on a bicycle, even if you have gears, like for me, to, there's a like quite a stout uphill between me and my Trader Joe's. And it's not that I don't want to ride to it. It's just that if I'm running an errand, I mean, I want to, I want my bike ride to be recreational. I want my errands to be speedy and fun. Right. Efficient. Efficient. Yeah. And the Upco absolutely nails that. I just, well, oh man. It's, as somebody who's ridden mo regular motorcycles, I mean, I, I, I have to assume that, I mean, obviously everything you just described is, partially why when you go to Europe, everybody's on a little, a little scooter, right? Like there's what they're more efficient. They're more fun. You know, it's just easier to get around with one. But, um, I, I obviously, I, I would think that the bonus or the benefit of it being electric is even more pronounced in, on something like that than it is in a car, just in terms of the silence and the glide and all that sort of stuff. I mean, talk about that a little bit, like the difference between riding this versus like, a, like a gas powered small mo motorcycle. I think the, one of the big things is the noise um, is there's there's more power with pretty much any kind of fossil fueled motorcycle, dirt bike or otherwise. Um, I, w I would probably hurt or kill myself if I were on a full fledged mm -hmm. motorcycle these days, honestly, because it's just so much fun to go fast. And um, I as much as I would love the Upco to be to go more than 30, it was it's plenty. That's pretty. That's plenty fast. I mean, thirty is pretty quick. Yeah, it's pretty quick, and and on dirt, you don't need to go faster than that on dirt. In fact, I often found myself on dirt going way, way slower because I, I just want to 
take in my surroundings and in, enjoy it. And I don't want to come around a corner and somebody's there. I want to be a good citizen. And um, so I, the the noise factor of of a especially a dirt bike. I mean, you cannot overestimate how obnoxious that is for you on the bike and for the people around you and that silence and the the torque of it the, the freedom of like going around a berm and just torquing it and it's completely silent it's it's just super addictive so we're going to take a little break and when we come back we're going to talk there's not everything is not perfect with the upco there are a few things that um i think are worth discussing a few uh things that kind of cut both way both ways and then we're going to talk about the applications like why would you want a utility bike like this or not, why would you maybe prefer an e-motorcycle? Why might you want um, more of an a e-dirt bike style like the Cake? Um, and what are the applications for the backcountry? Where would we use these things? We'll be right back. You love adventure, we love adventure, and that is why we created Adventure Journal in print. It is the gift that we've made for ourselves and for our friends and hopefully for you that is analog, that gets away from screens, that gives you some of the most interesting, deepest and thoughtful stories from some of the best writers and photographers working in the outdoor space. We do four a year. You get free shipping and a deep discount. It's 60 bucks to have this absolutely beautiful, no batteries necessary celebration of adventure in your mailbox. Get it at adventure-journal.com. I am drinking, it's gotten cold now because we're halfway through the show. I am drinking Long Weekend Coffee. We launched Long Weekend Coffee earlier this year to bring you and us blends that are not fussy, that will take any kind of brew method that we like, whether it's at home, in a cabin, on the tailgate of a truck, doesn't matter. We have four blends. We have dark, medium, espresso roast, and a decaf. I think they're pretty amazing. I guarantee you will like them. Check us out at longweekend.coffee. Welcome back to our discussion of the UBCO 2x2 electric motorcycle and what kind of role a bike like this might have in public lands in the backcountry. Justin, you have questions. Well, yeah, so UBCO approached me too about testing one out and um, I said no because I, I don't think I'd be able to ride it anywhere around here other than on the street. Um, you know, we're a lot like in Marin County, you're allowed to ride bikes on fire roads and a very sparse handful of single track trails. All fire roads are open, but technically like something like 90% of our fire roads, you're not actually supposed to even have an e-bike on. Um, and so I, you know, I thought, I thought about it for a bit and I thought, well, I could probably kind of chance it. I don't know that anybody would say anything, but these look, these clearly don't have pedals. So, I mean, it's, it's, I think most people would, would right off the bat be able to tell that it's um, an electric motorcycle. And so, you know, even if I were to, I, I mean, I'd love to have something like this, but I'd have to trailer it around to anywhere I'd want to go. But even still, like, I don't really know, um, you know, obviously you can drive motorcycles on forest service roads and things like that in the mountains, um, which is where I would most likely ride something like this. But I don't know what the rules are even back there about like, once you hit like bike trails, like, can I take it on a bike trail? I don't even know. I mean, also, I'm not even sure if it would fit. Like there's a lot I don't really understand, but part of it, part of my reluctance was not to really understand the legalities of where you can take a bike like this. Uh, there's great question and it really depends on where you are. So yeah, just to reiterate, um, or to emphasize, uh, it does, this is not a pedal assist bike. Um, it is, uh, I, I want to say that pedal assist with throttle bikes are capped at 28 miles per hour, 28 miles 28. per hour, 28. Yeah. I forget what class that is. That's a class two. Yeah, it's a it's a pure throttle bike. And when you look at it, it's going to look just like a motorcycle. So, but kind of a cute motorcycle, like a motorcycle <laughs> with moxie. I'm sure, the Rangers, I'm sure the Rangers would appreciate that. Well, it, officer, it's cute. Like it's, you can't bust moxie. me for this. Look at Come this. On, it's super man. cute. It's, it's, it's yeah. yeah. So, well, obviously you can use it anywhere that you can use a motorized vehicle. I mean, yeah. it is a motorized vehicle and you can't use it in thus in wilderness right you know nor should you or any kind of bicycle um any place that uh i'm guessing you can use the class ones you could 
I, I don't know. I, yeah, I mean, see, that's like I, I bet you. Like, if you had it on fire roads down there, I'd be surprised if that was actually <laughs> if you were actually if that was okay. I well, mean, it depends on the fire road. So, yeah. but you can't um, have motorcycles on any of the fire fire roads, right? It depends on the fire road. Huh. You can in some places. Okay. Yeah. So in the Santa Ana Mountains, sometimes they close the roads because of fire or the, or because of heavy rains and they've washed out. But right now you can drive almost all the way to our closest mountain. Okay. Um, and uh, you can, there's motorcycles all over it. So, hmm. yeah. In fact, I actually took it up to the top of Saddleback. Well, it definitely feels like this is one of the things that will, uh, I mean, we, 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 the outdoor, well, I mean, the outdoor community doesn't, the law enforcement community and for, at various levels, whether it's actually like police forces versus just water, like, you know, open space managers and stuff really needs to, we need to have a big conversation about how we're going to rethink some of the rules about things. Cause I mean, around here, the reason you can't have e-bikes anywhere is because the fire roads are very specifically no motorized vehicles. And so, I mean, this is a thing that's we've been kind of talking about for years since e-bikes hit the, hit the market. But, um, you know, what do you do with this? Right? Like you, I, I, you, I'm already skirting it with an e-bike on a, on a fire road. And so something like this is even more down that road, but it's obviously there should, there's nothing wrong with it. Like, I mean, it should be perfectly fine. So our closest mountain bike park is in Laguna beach and it's, it's called Aliso and Woods Canyons wilderness park. And, um, I, there's dozens and dozens of miles of single track there and, and, uh, some of it legal, some of it poachy and then there's lots of fire roads and this bike would be, you know, woefully overkill there. There's a lot of hikers. There's a lot of walkers. Um, this bike would stand out like a sore thumb there. Right. On, on the other hand, um, the e-bikes are illegal there, e-bikes of any kind, but easily the majority of bikes there on any given day are e-bikes, pedal bikes. Um, most of them, you know, look like you're the Turbo Levo that you were just riding, yeah. the one that I have. I've not ridden mine there even though it's sort of de facto legal or unenforced just because I, I would just feel crappy about it. Mm -hmm. Even though everybody else around me is doing that. Mm -hmm. um, there are other places here and, you know, excuse me of being a hypocrite, but I mean, there are other places here where it's not as popular, where the, it, it's more of a, what do you sort suburban wasteland but you know it's like i was mm -hmm. i mentioned like sacrificial lands there's places that are just kind of cruddy you know they're yeah they're, bad, they're nice but like you know there's oh over there's where people dump stuff or whatever right. you know and like power line roads or whatever we don't have a lot of those but that that kind of place around here where where e-bikes are technically illegal not technically they are illegal and people just ride them and i've ridden i rode the ubco there and i just the only thing that i cared about was being a good citizen and not being obnoxious to people who are hiking. And then I just slowed and I said hi to them and I talked to them and I used it to, I used the Ubco to go pick up trash and haul out a lot of trash. Cause I felt like that was, oh, a, that was that's like such an awesome way to use it. That's great. I thought that was a fine way to use it. And again, you know, technically quote unquote illegal, but I just didn't have any problems with it. And so I, you know, I care about how, I personally am perceived on the trail and also how a person riding that particular type of device is perceived by other trail users. And so like in this area, like Lisa Woods that gets so much traffic, I just don't want to be that dick that's riding yeah. an e-bike, even if everybody else does. And I've talked a lot. I've talked to the rangers there. I know some of the volunteers and the docents and they're frustrated because it apparently it has come from above. And I don't know how far up above, but basically don't enforce it. And I think yeah. that the the powers that be are just kicking kicking the can down the road. They don't want to deal with it because if you call it a wilderness park, you should probably not have any kind of motorized assist at all there. And yet the people have spoken, you know, they're on power assisted bikes and there's a lot of bike brands here in Southern California. I don't know what kind of lobbying clout they have not to enforce it. So I could easily see it's just sort of like everybody does it. So everybody does it, which is a really first, frankly, frustrates me either you it's illegal and you enforce it or it's legal 
and then you enforce like speed limits or right. you know you use education to make people be a good citizen. And with the UBCO, I, you know, I see the UBCO as this is more of a kind of a forest service BLM mm-hmm. kind of place. Like I don't mm-hmm. think that you would necessarily, maybe you would, but I don't know you'd necessarily want to rip up <laughs> poor choice of words, haul ass on single, haul, go fast on single tracks with this. Yeah. I just, yeah. it feels like, uh, you know, bringing a submachine gun to it. You know, a knife, a <laughs> no, knife I agree. I mean, this seems like something like, that I would, I would think of this as just basically an electric off-road motorcycle. I mean, that's how I would look at it. So I would be taking it with me had I, I guess I could have a truck, but you know, it seems if I don't really have a way to get it in the truck, but I, I would take this with me out to the, out to the, you know, the Eastern side of the Sierra where, you know, right. There's basically, you can ride wherever you want or take it to an OHV, you know, friendly zone. That, that would be my use case, which is too bad because I will ride e-bikes all the time up to the lakes near my house to go fishing. Um, which is, which is, it's great that I can do it. Gotta be easier with this. You know, like I, one of the things I would love to do is, is be able to get my daughters with me on the back of the you know e-bike and I kind of can, but it's a, it's a pain in the butt. Uh, even with full power pedal assist e-bikes to like ride up these fire roads to the lakes, but something like this, goodness, I could put one on the back of a full spread of food, fishing poles, everything we need for a day to hang out. Perfect. Um, you know, well, it, that that's an ideal scenario for this. It has mm-hmm. a 300 pound weight limit. Wow. So, you know, even if you're too hunsky, then you're, you know, you got another hundred pounds of payload mm-hmm. that you can put on there. Um, you'll you'll start to impact the the range and the two complaints that i had about the bike were they both came in the dirt and the one is that i i was like a kid in a candy store and i did drive it as fast as i could <laughs> and um there was a lot of soft sand and it, you know i i i burned through the range pretty quickly so you know i i think 50 is a safer way to think about it and probably less than that if you're you know if you're hauling up the steeps the other thing this was what was really interesting to me so i um i was visiting my mom was in the hospital a year or so ago or earlier this year and uh there's a there's actually a green belt that goes pretty much all the way there and so i and it's it's again it's sort of one of those um you know kind of green belts that sort of like yeah, kids ride dirt bikes and you know people mm-hmm. ride mountain bikes and it, it was after rain it was pretty muddy and man the the traction that i had with two wheel drive and the slop where it was impossible to avoid was was just phenomenal it was cool. such a hoot but then the downside of it was when i took it out in the mojave and i was trying to climb some steep and rocky stuff and that's where like so if you you haven't ridden a motorcycle but it's not so different on a on a Mm-hmm. Is, is on a mountain bike is that you want your weight planted over the back mm-hmm. wheel because that's where all of your power is going your chain is directing all your power to the back wheel and so you want to have this balance with your your upper body so that you have enough weight over the front wheel that it's not coming off the ground but enough back weight so that all that power is going to the back the back wheel well with the ubco um what i found was that the front wheel would spin out especially huh. where it was kind of ledgy and it wasn't like really planted in the dirt. And so what would be really interesting is if you could transfer more of that power, if you could do it automatically, right? like if it had some kind of, I, I don't know what the electric device would be, but if it had an electric device where you could read like the slippage in the front wheel and transfer it to the back, like with, um, with traction control systems in cars, exactly. it, I know yeah. it increases braking, right? And, and then automatically mm-hmm. the, the power goes to the other wheel. It would be nice if it could do that because hmm. um, I was just, I've spun the front wheel and I didn't feel comfortable enough like getting out of the saddle and leaning forward over the front, the front wheel and, and trying to get more of my weight on that. It was, it got to be kind of a big deal. Like if it's a fire road, you're kind of fine. But like I was on some single track, it was loose and it was rocky and I just, I spun out and I had to, then I had to get off the bike and I had to figure out, it was really quite tricky to gun it, but not so much that the bike like jumped out of my hands. So, yeah. So there's no way, I guess with an electric, with an electric motor, there's probably, it's not really a lo- like you can't have a low range, right? Like it's just, it just, it's either, it's either on or off. Like I think it just either has power or it doesn't. So I don't know how you would even, I don't know how like electric cars do it, you know, but they, but they're able to effectively mimic 
things like low range and stuff like that. But it's probably more with braking than anything else. I'm not really sure how that works, but that that is an interesting. I don't know either, but dilemma. it seems like a software thing, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I wonder if you could almost apply the front brake to keep the front wheel from spinning as much. That wouldn't direct the more power to the back, but it, maybe you don't spin out. I mean, there's probably ways around it. I don't know. I know that two by two motorcycles exist, uh, but like a one of my good friends is a endurance motorcycle guy, um, and he he won't ever use one. He said, you know, I've tried them, and they're, they're, they're you know they're for like really specific applications in snow and stuff like that, but. Um, it's a, it's an interesting choice to have done it that way. I wonder how different it would be if it was just a rear wheel drive motorcycle. I don't know. You know, I had the thought I was just picturing like a big roost, you know, going on berm and just gunning it on a traditional bur- dirt bike and you get this the big rooster tail, you right. know, and and I was thinking how much more um relatively speaking how much more environmentally responsible it would be maybe to have a two-wheel drive mm-hmm. because it's it's kind of impossible not to want to like gun it on yeah. a dirt bike, you know, and and so I ruts can develop, and you know I just I wonder if by equal power over both wheels you're less likely to, or you're more likely to have a lower impact. I I don't know. I hmm. mean, it's the bike's not designed for that. Right, it's not designed to power. I don't think to power up super steep hills and ledgy things and be a trials bike it's designed to be a utility bike and it does that exceptionally well so i I wanted to kind of see what what its limitations were like how far can you go with this and how what can't you do with it do you so charging wise um uh, regular like a regular e-bike right you just plug it into a standard outlet yes and i I think from near empty to full is about four to six hours so that seems like it's about stand. I mean, that may be a little bit more than a re- than a regular bike, but I'm not actually 100 percent sure how long it takes to charge my e-bikes. But it's probably about that, I would think, to full charge. I'm guessing about that. I mean, I feel like my Levo takes forever to charge, and it's mostly just because I want it to be instant, and it isn't. So yeah, I think it's probably in the four four hour range. Did you look at any um, options for um, some sort of like a like a portable battery, so that if you wanted to do some sort of longer distance ride in the desert or something like that, you'd have a way to charge your bike on the ride. I, I have not. And I don't know that if they sell one, I'd, I'd have to, I don't, they have a lot. Uh, they do sell one. Actually, you can get a second battery. It's uh very expensive. No, it is like, <laughs> sorry. I think it's 2,500. So okay. I would be willing to do that if I bought the bike, which it's probably something like I'm going to, but um, you know, that, it's so comfortable. I mean, one of the things about motorcycles and being in a dirt, I mean, it can be exhausting, right? I mean, it yeah. can be like, but when you're out there, you're out there. And and so let's talk about applications a little bit and how you might use this. Um, you know, my, how I use the bike and how, if I were to own one, how I would use it is, you know, I would probably, if I could get to the trailhead on dirt and then take the Ubco and leave the truck behind is, is what I would do. And then in what I used it for, I did some peak bagging, you know, I did some scrambles up things. You can also, there's, they make a surfboard rack, they make a gun rack, they make um, all kinds of things for stores. They have panniers, they have a moly uh, panel that you can put on it. The the center in the cockpit is, uh, so it's, it's a, it's a um, tube frame the whole bike okay. is. And so you can, they, they sell a bag that you could put in the middle or you could drop your own. Um, you can have like a saddle bag. There's, there's so many things that you can put on it. And that's just first party. That's just Ubco's brand stuff. So as these things get more popular, I mean, you can just imagine trailers. I mean, there's all kinds oh, of things yeah. that you can, yeah. you know, so if you're a hunter, you can imagine hauling, you know, your kill out in this thing. You can um, imagine like as a photographer, like to, mm-hmm. to be silent in the backcountry, and I'm air quotes around backcountry because it's obvious places that you can go motorized. Um, you know, I did a lot of shooting on this thing, and I would put the camera in that center console area, and then I would just shoot, and I, I would I would drive, and I would just find something, and I would oftentimes shoot from the saddle, or you know, throw the kickstand and get back on. You know, and unlike with a motorized, you're not um, you don't have to turn it off. You, know, yeah. you don't have to change the key. If you want to like run a hundred yards off the, the trail or the road, you turn the key and it locks the handlebars to one side or the other. So nobody's going to take the bike. That's pretty cool. 
It's amazing. Like the That's sense of cool. mobility and anybody who's been on a, a bike, but then on an e-bike or on a motorcycle knows that that sense of freedom that you have, it's addictive. And to me, the Ubco was, it was bringing like the best of an e-bike and the best of a, of a, a mountain bike and the best of a motorcycle without all of the guilt and the fumes and the gas and the sound. So anything that you might want to do more stealthily, mm -hmm. you would do on this. And, um, you know, bike packing. You think about bike packing on this thing. I mean, I, I like bike packing, but I don't like hauling my stuff up on, on downhill, up, up hills. You know, I, I'd rather, we, we talked in our last episode about the ups and downs of backpacking, like to take this a little farther back than you might normally go and then do a day hike off of it and maybe lock up your cooler to it. So you have cold drinks when you come back, you know, even, even if you aren't en enthusiastic about the idea of using something like this yourself, I'm just thinking about how wonderful it would be and probably will be. I mean, these are going to take off more and more. I know that you can get electric ATVs now. I think side-by-sides are, are electric side-by-sides are a thing now too. Um, you know, some of the spots I like to spend time in the summer are near enough to OHV areas where I can hear it. And that, that drives me nuts, you know, and, and especially, or in, or for example, well, I used to go to Montana a lot. My wife and I would go on these like big epic horse rides up, um, up in the mountains. It was incredible. And I'd go fishing from back there, but th those, a lot of the trails we're on are open to anything. So you might encounter dirt bikes, you know, we'd be on horses and here would come some dirt bikes up the trail, you know, um, but you could hear those too, like a long ways away. It, it, it'll just be nice. I'm just thinking of a future where there's more electric stuff like that out there. And so it's just quieter for everybody. I mean, it's just such a bummer to hear the whine, like you said earlier, of a two stroke or really anything once you're out in the back country. So that even, even if you don't want one of these, like it's pretty cool that hopefully this sort of technology takes off and man, it would be really fun to have one of these in Montana. The more I think about it, I mean, we used to we'd ride horses up at these pretty cool lakes that are, you know, they're just way too far for day hikes. You'd see some backpackers out there, but oh my god, just throw some fishing poles and, and like a nice canvas tent, some like real nice heavy stuff, some good food on, the, on one of these things. Get up there, oh. yeah, a little trailer with some suspension on it. I mean, horses are fun, but these are even better. You got to feed it; it's quieter, perfect. Yeah, it's interesting how much sound carries in the mountains. I mm -hmm. did a demo with Rivian. I went to one of their press intros in Breckenridge, Colorado. And there's a lot of people that do four-wheeling out there. And we had a, I don't even remember, eight, nine of these trucks. And we would stop for the photographers and they'd shoot things. And we'd get to the top of something and we'd kind of hang out while they were shooting and just absolutely dead silent. As they got closer, yeah. you could hear the tires right. on on the rocks, but when from a distance they were absolutely silent. And then some Jeep folks came through, and people in fossil fuel pickup trucks, and you'd hear, even though oh. they weren't as loud as a as a dirt bike, you'd hear them from five miles away before you'd see them. Yeah, and silence is is a big. As a big element of a backcountry experience. It's a, you know, of connecting with nature, whether you're the person in or on the vehicle or not, you know? And so, yeah, I'm, I'm excited. I'm concerned because the authorities don't seem to want to be dealing with this sort of stuff. And mm -hmm. man, some of the side-by-sides that are out in the Mojave and, and some of the stories I'm hearing about the destruction that they're doing and some of the ATVs, I mean, there has to be a lot of education around these things because the electric are coming, you know, and they're going to be a lot more affordable and people and are more accessible. Them. I mean, it sounds like if you can just waltz in and buy one of these for like five grand without a special license or something like that, like more people will do it. I mean, you, I'm sure you heard about the BLM just closed like 300 miles of, of land outside Moab to, to vehicles. Um, and then that was specifically just because of damage to the cryptobiotic soil. So like that's, that's going to be a bigger issue. Um, generally speaking. So, yeah, some I maybe not actually when I went to well, I drove the new Bronco at a, at a Ford event a couple of years back. The first thing they tell you is be smart in the backcountry because people you know the more people get out there, the more people have the opportunity to to drive these vehicles anywhere they want. The more likely we are to lose access to some of these places. So absolutely, yeah. And Moab is one of the worst. So Utah, southern Utah is one of the worst places for a anti-government sentiment and a screw you to public lands. And, you know, they've long had these 
ETV wrecking parties where they go into wilderness study areas. And there's some people that you're just never gonna, you're just never gonna get them onto the side of, you know, environmental stewardship. You're just not. But there are a lot of people that just don't know. You know, we we discussed this when we just in our episode about Cairns. There are people that right. have no idea what kind of impact this has on things. There's some people that don't care, but there's some people that just don't know. So I think there does need to be an education campaign campaign. And to you know, to Rivian's credit, when we were out there, I mean, they talked specifically about how to drive lightly yeah. and how not to go flying through you know water crossings and things like that. Like that, uh, and hopefully the motorsports business and that includes e-bike companies understands that you know if if they want to be out in public lands widely then they need to educate the people who are you know who are buying them um so yeah so we'll just touch real quickly on some of the other options that are out there before we wrap this up so one of the bikes that i have been really curious i kind of did backflips when I first saw it at the Aotearoa Real Trade Show is the Cake, the Cock from Cake, which is the company's founded by the guy who founded POC. Um, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Huh. yeah. And so the the POC makes tons of really, I love their their products. Yeah, they do great stuff. Great stuff. Then they started as a as a safety brand with helmets and other things. And um, POC, if, if you don't know, stands for piece of cake. It so, does. It does. <laughs> I th- oh, I looked it up. I thought, yeah, okay, I'm sure. No, you're probably right. I Somebody can fact check me, but they. I went to a. I went to an event with cake. That's and they great. Told me it was a piece of cake. And That's so then great. Cake motorcycles, you know, come out of ah. Yeah. Okay. So so the so the impetus behind Cake was very different than with Ubco. Ubco wanted to build a utility bike for farm work in New Zealand. Mm-hmm. Cake. Uh, I, I forget the founder, Pox founder's names, but he has a couple boys. They're, I don't know, they're probably grown up now, but, and he was a big mountain biker and he wanted a more environmentally responsible way to, you know, go out and ride trails. And so they have a very strong environmental ethos and they, well, I can't speak for the company, but I, I think one of the reasons why the prices are so high, I mean, you can get now a cake dirt bike electric style for around 9,000, but early on it was like 13,000. That's still so much money. It's still a lot of money. And and so they put a lot of their efforts into trying to be, you know, zero carbon impact. Like they're really trying to push the envelope of what you can do with their technology. They have some utility bikes that are in the same range as Ubco, four or five, $6,000. They have a lot of uh, accessories that you can put on. Um, they look more utilitarian. They look like the kind of bike that you're going to see delivering, you know, doing DoorDash in cities. And that was the intended use. Um, their motorcycle, their e-motorcycles look very much like dirt bikes. They're super sexy. I mean, God, they're just, ugh. I haven't even ridden one. I'm dying to ride one. Um, to me, having ridden the Ubco and just to the eye, I, I think the Ubco... I think those guys have absolutely nailed the middle ground between those mm-hmm. two. It's a utility bike that looks super sexy and rides kind of super sexy, like uh, like you would want a dirt e bike to be. You're not going to jump this thing. This isn't. You're not going to go to the track with this. That's not what it's for. But for that ninety percent of other stuff that you want to do in the middle, I think they've absolutely crushed it. Well, hopefully, there's going to be more coming. I mean, the Upco looks great. Uh, I mean, I can't afford a nine thousand dollar or even the you know bike from Cake, but I know Zero exists. Um, but those are those look. I mean, Zeros are a whole different world uh, in terms of motorcycles. They look like more real deal motorcycles. But uh, yeah, I, I'd love to see more things like this out there. I don't see. I mean, I'm sure there's other brands working on this sort of thing. I know you love and love uh, where you live. You live in an amazing place. It is absolutely gorgeous here. It's ridiculous in Moran, uh, the access to the city. Um, if you lived anywhere else, you'd be saving up for one. Oh, no doubt. <laughs> so it's just a function of the fact that things are so restrictive where you are because no doubt. It, it is, uh, man, it just, it feels like you've, it's like nothing else I, I've ever written. And no, I'm not being paid to say this by Ubco. I don't don't really know those guys. They, they loan me a bike for a few months. They're not an advertiser. They'll probably never be. I don't care. I just have, I can't tell you when I've had so much fun on two wheels. It is, I told everybody I knew. And I'm, I guess I'm telling a lot of people I don't know. I mean, they just, they've absolutely nailed a bike that is reasonably priced, that will go far on a charge, 
Um, and it does something that nothing quite else does yet that probably will at some point, but at this point it, it doesn't. And yeah, I'm, I'm over the moon and, um, yeah, I'm going to go look at my bank account after we're done with this episode because it's just talking about it just gets me so excited yeah. about it. I've had so much fun on this. Well, I'm sold, man. I'm sold. I'll move. I'll just move. I'll move somewhere where I can ride one. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. I'm going to keep work. <laughs> I'm going to keep working on this guy. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, I'm stoked that you're here with us on the Adventure Journal podcast. Um, you know the drill on all these things. Any kind of follows, likes, ratings, it helps us out a lot. Um, if you love adventure, you will love what we do with Adventure Journal in print. You can subscribe to that for 60 bucks a year, which is a massive discount um, off our single copy price, and you get free shipping. You can do that at adventure-journal.com. And that's all I have for today. Thanks. Bye.